Joseph Campbell once said. If you want to change the world, you have to change the metaphor. Let's see how this might apply to the threat of nuclear war. What follows is a set of eight videos rolled into one. Each one has a unique purpose. Together they comprise a viable alternative to war. The first one is a video by Dr. Jack Geiger from the 1980s, talking about the reality of nuclear war. Number two is about the organization Beyond War and the Beyond War Award. Then there is a brief video about the phenomenon known as normalcy bias. Next is a video about our highest purpose as humans. Then, number five, is a video entitled Alternative to War. Next, number six, is a very important video, showing what is called the Axis Shift Diagram of Love Shift. Then, a video about perception and Sam Keen's landmark book, Faces of the Enemy. Finally, a video about our highest nature and the purpose of our existence on Earth. There has never been a better time to see and share these ideas, for the benefit of all life. I hope you will watch the whole set, maybe even twice, and send this content out to everyone you know. Love Shift. Working together we can make a difference. The question that I'm going to address this afternoon seems a straightforward one. What will happen to San Francisco in the event of a specified nuclear attack? What will happen to its people? What will happen to its physical environment? What will happen to its biological environment? What will happen to its structure of medical care? Hiroshima was 12 and a half to 15 kilotons. At one megaton on San Francisco or any other population center, we are trying to imagine 70 Hiroshima bombs all at once, all in one place. Let me turn first to the specifiable events. A single explosion, an air burst at 7,000 feet over downtown San Francisco in the fall on a clear day, a working day, let's say a Monday, in dry weather at about 3 o'clock. In short, let's say today, now, at this moment. I draw your attention to the map. Uh, that first circle, this is for one megaton air burst, remember, with a radius of about one and a half miles, is an area in which the overpressures are 20 pounds per square inch, which will destroy everything. Winds are 500 miles an hour. Uh, reinforced concrete and steel buildings of the strongest construction will either collapse totally or have all of their floors swept out from within the structure. The heat is such that most everybody will be either vaporized or killed by third degree burns if indeed they're not killed by uh, other trauma. Circle two with a radius of three miles has over pressures of 10 pounds per square inch, winds at 160 miles an hour, brick and wood frame houses destroyed, suppose people seriously burn. And I'll just mention uh, one thing about overpressures of anywhere from a half a pound per square inch to two pounds per square inch, it'll take a glass window and turn it into a thousand particles of glass traveling at an excess of a hundred miles an hour. The winds create a low pressure area as they move outward, surrounding air rushes in, fanning the many fires started by the thermal radiation and initial blast damage. One can expect these kinds of fires for a radius of anywhere from 8 to 16 miles, depending on the megatonnage. Firestorms of this type, aside from Hiroshima, developed after a series of conventional air raids on Hamburg in 1943, Leipzig and Dresden. They produced temperatures estimated at 800 degrees centigrade, 1472 degrees Fahrenheit. Days after the raid, as some shelters were open, Enough heat was found to have remained so that the influx of oxygen caused the entire shelter to burst into flames. What a firestorm does is increase the lethal area of a nuclear attack for a single bomb fivefold. The more important point in terms of some dreams of civil defense planning and the like is that in Hamburg and Leipzig, the only people who survived were those who fled their shelters, not those who entered or stayed in them because the shelters simply turned into crematoria at those temperatures. 
at one megaton in an airburst of the 3,613,000 people in the San Francisco metropolitan area, 780,000 would be killed outright. The total casualties are 1,162,500 people, almost precisely every third person. Let me turn briefly to the types of injuries you have already today heard about, uh, some of them. Uh, overwhelmingly, first of all, third degree burns. Certainly thousands, probably tens of thousands in the case of the multiple 20 megatons ex explosions in the hundreds of thousands. And that of course exceeds by thousands, by orders of magnitude, the total number of burn beds in the United States, let alone in the San Francisco metropolitan Bay Area. Second degree burns of course on top of those. Crushing injuries due to the collapse of buildings and related kinds of trauma. Ruptured internal organs, especially rupture of the lungs. Penetrating wounds of the skull, the thorax, and the abdomen because all kinds of objects have been turned into missiles traveling at high speeds. Simple and compound, compound fractures of all kinds, including skull fractures, because people have been turned into missiles traveling at high speeds until they hit the nearest hard object, wall, or whatever. And of course hemorrhage. And of course all of the above in combination. And two things that aren't mentioned very often, significant numbers among the wounded survivors who will be deaf because of ruptured eardrums, and even larger numbers who will be blind. Anybody within 35 miles down as far as San Jose in the south, well into Marin County in the north, 35 miles to the east, who makes a reflex glance at the fireball, and there will be many such people at distances up to 35 miles as a probability of being blinded by retinal burning. Say a word about the radiation effects uh, without being too redundant. It will be impossible for anybody to distinguish on the basis of symptomatology between people who have had only 100 REMS and might survive with adequate care and people who have had 1,000 REMS and are not going to survive no matter what anybody does with whatever kinds of resources. But again, to talk of response becomes a kind of absurdity and a kind of delusion again when we look at the data. Who will respond and what will they have to respond with? Physicians and hospitals, as has been mentioned, are destroyed at rates greater than that of the population because they tend to be concentrated in downtown urban areas in the zones of highest lethality. And it is a conservative calculation without taking you through every detail that there would be less than 2,000 physicians in the San Francisco metropolitan area, the area that we're talking about in terms of the population base, able to function. Uh, and there would be fewer than 2,000 beds. If every physician spent only 10 minutes on the diagnosis and treatment of each patient and worked 20 hours every day at one to a thousand, it would be eight days before every injured person is seen for the first time by a physician for 10 minutes. But there is a further dimension in which this estimate is meaningless because it is talk to talking of physicians or other health workers working without equipment, without diagnostic aids, without laboratories, without therapeutic resources, without blood or plasma, without caches of blood supplies, or any of the other things that are needed for contemporary medical management of trauma, burns, or even uh, lesser injuries. So the effectiveness of that 10-minute diagnostic and therapeutic visit uh, is likely to be almost zero. You must remember that there will be no electric power, there will be no water, there will be no transportation system. Most of the buildings and streets and geography and terrain will be unrecognizable. There will be no organized systems of communication. And I remind you in the scenario we are describing, there is no probability of help from outside. What this means in sum is that most of the seriously injured persons will never see a physician or other health worker, even for the simple administration of narcotics for their pain, before they die. And it seems to me highly probable that the survivors will envy the dead. The only true meaning of survival in complex urban industrial societies is not mere biological survival. It is social survival. 
the biological survivors, in fact, have all, pro in all probability, merely postponed by days, weeks, months, at most a few years, their deaths from secondary attack-related causes. Some conclusions. There is no survival in any sense of that word that has social meaning from a nuclear attack. Mass evacuation provides no rational basis for planning for survival. I testified not long ago before a Senate hearing in which the successors to that set of Office of Civil Defense Mobilization people, now called the Federal Emergency Management Program, uh, testified and they said cheerfully for a specifiable nuclear attack that they already had plans that would take care of 7% of the population and if they were just given enough funding and a little time they could work out plans to protect up to 80% of the United States population in the event of an all-out nuclear exchange. One of the senators asked them what technique they had in mind and they answered mass evacuation of course and they were asked how long notice would they require to affect such a plan successfully, and they said, only eight days. <laughs> it is my belief that any physician who even takes part in so-called emergency medical disaster planning specifically to meet the problem of nuclear attack, any physician who even takes, place, takes part in such an activity is committing a profoundly unethical act. He is deluding himself or herself, colleagues, and by implication the public at large into the false belief that mechanisms of survival in any meaningful social sense are possible. But there is a positive responsibility as well as that negative one, I think, and that is the obligation to assess these data, to inform, to instruct. I think the time is limited. I think the responsibilities that we face are awesome. I welcome your participation in this conference as a first or continuing step in the assumption of those responsibilities. Thank you. In the last half century, two events have impacted everyone living today. First, we moved totally outside of ourselves, looked back, and realized that we all share one fragile life-giving world, our home. And no matter what color we are, or what religion we believe in, we are interconnected, interdependent on the same life support system of sun, water, air, and earth. We are one sharing a common history and a common destiny, and all with the capacity for generosity, compassion, and goodwill. The second event has placed our world and all of its people at risk of extinction. The kill power of today's sophisticated weaponry has made all war obsolete, and yet men, women, and children are dying today in 40 wars raging the world over, as nations still attempt to resolve their differences with violence. Good afternoon, Beyond War. The Beyond War movement is a direct response of people to that crisis. People everywhere who believe that we can change the way we think about war and violence, that we can resolve ancient enmity, and learn to cooperate to conquer unmet basic human needs. That we can use our collective genius and the resources of our Earth for the well-being and universal rights of all. All nations, all races, and all religions. The Beyond War Award is an expression of that belief, presented each year to honor the individual or group having made an outstanding contemporary contribution toward building a world beyond war. 
The first award was given to the National Conference of Catholic Bishops, USA, for their pastoral letter, which asked that the world say no to the weapons of mass destruction. In 1984, in the first live television space bridge between San Francisco and Moscow, the award went to the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, the IPPMW, for educating the world that nuclear war is not survivable. 3,000 people attended the event in San Francisco, 800 in Moscow, and 90,000 watched on television. The program was later rebroadcast on PBS and Soviet TV and seen by more than a million viewers. In 1985, in a historic live television link-up circling the globe, the Beyond War Award was given to the Five Continent Peace Initiative. The heads of state of Mexico, Sweden, Greece, Argentina, Tanzania, and India for their call to the people of the world for a universal demand in defense of our right to live. Millions of people in the five continents viewed either the live telecast or subsequent rebroadcasts. In 1986, the award went to the Contadora Group, Colombia, Mexico, Panama, and Venezuela for their efforts toward the resolution of conflict in Central America. The public's encouragement of the Contadora efforts helped pave the way for the Arias Peace Plan and subsequently the Guatemala Peace Accord. In 1987, the honor went to 120,000 current and return volunteers of the Peace Corps for their 26 years of promoting world peace, understanding, and friendship in more than 90 countries. Thousands of former and present volunteers attended the telecast all over the country, and the program was seen on cable stations, PBS, and satellite downlinks all over the United States. Nominations for the Beyond War Award are received from all over the world. They come from ambassadors to the United States or United Nations, from corporate leaders, religious leaders, the foreign and domestic press corps, university and college presidents, and other international leaders. The general public is also invited to participate, with special ads run in selected magazines. And more than 20,000 copies of the Beyond War newsletter include a special insert inviting nominations. More than 200 different individuals and groups were nominated for the 1987 award. Then a research team goes to work, thoroughly investigating each nomination, reviewing all available background materials, evaluating, and making recommendations. Finally, the list of nominees is submitted in a nomination information booklet prepared for each member of the Beyond War Selection Committee. This committee has drawn on distinguished men and women from throughout the world, former heads of state and first ladies, ambassadors and advisors, educators and scientists, Nobel laureates, authors, religious, corporate, and social leaders. From its inception, the selection committee has been honored with people whose own lives and actions demonstrate a deep concern for the quality and continuance of all life on Earth. It always gives me enormous pleasure to see the number of people that are being considered for this award and, and to realize how much good is actually being done. And I think although one is aware of efforts by many groups and many people around the world to, to foster understanding and to foster peace, the um, brochure brings it all together and makes one focus and think and evaluate. And I find that a very useful exercise for me and a very positive experience. Through the miracle of space-age electronics, our world has become smaller. We are now able to bridge oceans and continents instantaneously. The voices of Africa blend with those of Europe and the Soviet Union, and then join those of South and North America, harmonizing in one global voice, singing one song for all people. Since its creation, the Beyond War Award has brought the leaders and people of 11 countries face to face with the rest of the world. Hundreds of millions of people making friends across tens of thousands of miles, witnessing and reaffirming each other's hopes, dreams, and visions, and encouraging their continuing efforts toward a world free of injustice and violence. 11 countries, a new beginning. And now, to reach out to all the others, as we work together to build a world beyond war.
Hello, John Birch for Love Shift, and today I'd like to make a video about normalcy bias. Normalcy bias is a mental state which people enter into when faced with a potential disaster. It causes people to underestimate both the possibility of the disaster and the potential extent of its effects. The assumption made in the case of normalcy bias is that, since a disaster never has occurred, it never will occur. People with normalcy bias tend to interpret warnings in the most optimistic way possible, seizing on any ambiguities to infer a less serious situation than the one that actually is. When the bias is held collectively, the distorted thinking gains inertia which makes it even more difficult to eradicate. The nuclear threat is a classic example of normalcy bias. As generation upon generation grows up with the threat of nuclear annihilation, society becomes normalized to the danger and unable to respond appropriately. Humans on Earth are now seriously normalized to the possibility of a nuclear war. Helen Caldicott once called this heavy psychic numbing. Instead of being comfortable with the way things are, we should be terrified. We are complacent, even to the point of talking about preparing for winning and surviving such a war. What causes normalcy bias? Normalcy bias may be caused in part by the way the brain processes new data. Research suggests that even when the brain is calm, it takes 8 to 10 seconds to process new information. Stress slows the process, and when the brain cannot find an acceptable response to a situation, it fixates on a single default solution which may not be the best. How can we become unnormalized to a serious threat, such as the possibility of a nuclear war? This is one of the most important questions of our time. One answer is to talk. When we have conversations with others, we counteract the biases we have and learn from one another. If we will do this on a large scale, we can reverse a bias and replace it with relevant truth. And if this is done perpetually by many persons across the planet, a new inertia can emerge, which will be equally strong and far more effective. Visit www.loveshift.com forward slash normalcybias.html to learn more. Love Shift. Working together, we can make a difference. P.S. For those who like to read and want to begin their own personal transformation, the recent book by Martin and Dorothy Hellman, a new map for relationships is highly recommended. It's available on Amazon and at Barnes & Noble right now. As humans, our highest purpose is to discover, live and communicate what is needed to achieve a world that functions for the benefit of all life. Our home is a water planet called Earth, which is cradled in a universe of incredible beauty, mystery, and unfolding drama. We now know that everything from the largest galaxy to the smallest particle is part of one unified, interconnected, interdependent whole. Each of us is important and unique. However, at this moment in history, we are being called to set aside narrow self-interests and to act with integrity, consciousness, and a spirit of goodwill. Recognizing our common destiny, we need to envision a world in which love becomes the prevailing human function, cooperating together with all cultures, races, nations and religions to become as wise and loving as the system that produced us. The time is right for us to make a change. Love Shift. Working together, we can make a difference. This video is going to be about alternatives to war. In the 1980s, the organization Beyond War examined the institution of war and came to the conclusion that all war had become obsolete. If this is true, then what is the alternative? The typewriter still exists, but the word processor has made it obsolete. The horse and buggy still exists, but the automobile has made it obsolete. Phone booths and land lines still exist, but the mobile phone has made them obsolete. 
So what is the alternative to war? It's not a new jet, or weapon, or satellite or bomb. It's not a treaty, or law, or regulation or leader. And it's not a technology, although this will help. The alternative to war is relationship. Here is a quote from September 11, 2001, which sums up this truth. The only reliable resource for security in the world today is relationship. When relationships are healthy, you don't need any military to protect you. When relationships are unhealthy, the largest military in the world won't keep you safe. So what would a relationship-based security system look like? What are the specifics? Remember, in order to work, the solution must be complex, involve new thinking, and be relationship-based. Here are some aspects to the solution. They comprise, through their interactivity, a viable, cultural, alternative to war, a peaceful attitude, open communication, a flag of the world, group thinking, an expanded identity, an expanded level of concern, global patriotism, international conflict management, negotiation, scientific collaboration, sister city programs, sister schools, student exchange programs, shared peace traditions, empathy for other nations situations, free trade, international travel, democracy, arbitration, a new, shared, definition of what it means to be a soldier, economic interdependence, dialogue groups, peace learning programs, cultural exchanges, listening, diversity inclusion programs, pen pal programs, mutual tourism, taking all nuclear weapons off hair trigger alert, peace journalism, international cities of peace, elimination of launch on warning nuclear policy, shared no first use nuclear policy, nuclear weapons talks among all nations, compassion, holistic thinking, intercultural understanding, education, the Olympics, the promotion of nonviolence, agreement to not pose an enemy, goodwill, no blame, being inclusive, preventive diplomacy, conversations that matter, development of collective consciousness and what is called big C, being responsible, a new worldview. These and many other initiatives would form a benevolent complex. They might change over time. But, if made real, they would create a new intention on Earth. Together they would help emerge a global community with a culture that works for the benefit of all life. Together, they are more than powerful enough to make all war obsolete. The Axis Shift Diagram of Love Shift. www.loveshiftblog.com This video is made to answer a single question. What must we do in order to survive? The proposition of the video is that, in the absence of a shift in consciousness, we will not be able to move forward as a humanity. Where have we come from? Where are we going? And what must we do to have meaningful survival? These questions have challenged humans for many generations. One thing is now apparent. The existing paradigm is not working anymore. What does this mean? One way to answer this question is to observe how consciousness changes over time. To do this, we need to use a thing called a functional diagram. Functional diagrams show how one thing changes as a function of something else. The thing that changes first is called the independent variable and is graphed on the horizontal or x axis. The thing that changes second as a function of the first thing is called the dependent variable and is usually graphed on the vertical, y, axis. Eat more cheeseburgers, x axis, and you will gain weight, y axis. Spend money you don't have, x axis, and your credit score will suffer, y axis. The point is that the value of, y, depends on the amount of, x. Okay, back to time and consciousness. Let's look at the love shift diagram and see how it might contribute to our understanding of what we need to do to have meaningful survival. Looking at the axis shift diagram, and the image on the left of these three panels, one can see that, as we have evolved over the years, time has been the independent variable, on the horizontal, or, x, axis, and consciousness, c, on the vertical or, y, axis, has been dependent upon it. What that means is that, 
for millennia, as time chugged along, consciousness went up. This has worked for thousands of years. Unfortunately, it won't work anymore. Why? Look again at the diagram. See that red line, in the left panel, called the asymptote? That line is a mathematical limit to the function. Because the function is exponential, it cannot continue beyond it. We will not be able to succeed without a radical shift. In things like identity, relationship and culture. Our old way of thinking is over. Obsolete. Done. Finished. Forever. So what are we to do? Shift the axes. And make consciousness the independent variable, with the future dependent on it. If this is done collectively, we can create a new function, which will evolve and serve us as we move into the future. It has been shown that, when individuals claim that their consciousness is now, first cause, and their consciousness is collectivized, great amounts of energy are released for action. Visit www.loveshiftblog.com to learn more. Love Shift. Working together, we can make a difference. P.S. Let's look back at the Love Shift diagram again. See that green line? That's our consciousness, deciding to make the shift. Will we decide? Will we all decide together? Consciously? Collectively? If we do, we could form a global community with a culture that works for the benefit of all life. Please note. There are profound implications of making the love shift. Some examples are. Radical new levels of individual responsibility. Radical new levels of social responsibility. Global patriotism. Expanded and extended levels of concern. Seeing with, new eyes. Understanding that all war is obsolete. Long-term thinking at every level. Becoming as wise and loving as the system that produced us. A new understanding of the dynamics of climate change. New appreciation for the value of community. New definitions of words like family, sacred and subject. New practical forms of love, for Earth, ourselves and each other. The emergence of relationship as the most reliable resource for security in the world today. The emergence of collective mysticism, distributed functionality and the human array. A new orientation of humanity for the benefit of all life. A new understanding of our place in the universe, as the living context for everything we think, say and do. A collective alignment with the truth that all is one. A practical awareness that everything is in relationship with everything else, all the time, everywhere. And many others. Is shifting the axes, making consciousness the independent variable, going to be easy? Probably not. Is it essential? Absolutely. Is it good? Yes. And, because the changes implied by the shift are in alignment with the deep design and principles of the cosmos, they will help us move, successfully, individually and collectively, into a better, safer, more meaningful future. Want to learn more? Visit Love Shift, www.loveshiftblog.com. Insights on Hostility and Blame, from Sam Keen, the author of Faces of the Enemy. When nations find themselves in trouble either economically or politically, they often find a scapegoat to blame. This enemy is then painted as a barbarian, a dehumanized monster who must be fought and exterminated. The ancient game of good versus evil is set in motion. The face of the enemy is there to provide a target for our hatred. All wars are conducted as, holy, wars in the double sense then, as revelation of fate, a testing of divine favor, and as a means of purging evil from the world. If we yearn for peace, then the public in general and individuals in particular must confront our shadows and deal with the various ways in which we project our selfishness, greed, and violence onto others. This would mean that the United States must come to terms with its consensual paranoia and the myth of redemptive violence. Men and women must begin to confront their own bloodlust and the civil war within themselves. Even more importantly, we must find an alternative to the warrior myth which so animates our public and private lives. In the closing pages of his landmark book, Keane offers a curriculum of compassion, the education of Homo amicus. He lays out key subjects to be covered including the study of peace, the toxins of paranoia and propaganda, the clash between authority and individual conscience, 
the nature and use of power, the myths and rituals of compassionate living, the cultivation of listening and empathy, the practice of conflict resolution, and the inner work that must be done on the enemy inside each of us, and more. The problem seems to lie not in our reason or our technology, but in the hardness of our hearts. Generation after generation, we find excuses to hate and dehumanize each other, and we always justify ourselves with the most mature-sounding political rhetoric. And we refuse to admit the obvious. We human beings are homo hostilis, the hostile species, the enemy taking animal. We are driven to fabricate an enemy as a scapegoat to bear the burden of our denied enmity. From the unconscious residue of our hostility, we create a target. From our private demons, we conjure up a public enemy. And, perhaps, more than anything else, the wars we engage in are compulsive rituals, shadow dramas in which we continually try to kill those parts of ourselves we deny and despise. War is always reactionary, a drama in which two or more parties, who feel themselves powerless to do anything except respond to the aggressive initiative of the other, seek to demonstrate their superior potency. The first rule for discovering the treasure hidden in images of the enemy is this. Listen to what the enemy says about you, and you will learn the truth about yourself you have repressed. To come to greater self-understanding, borrowing the eyes of the other, see yourself from afar. Let the familiar become strange and the strange familiar, the two rules of creativity. We must look with suspicion on the rhetoric of your nation and listen with compassion to the reasons of the enemy. Change perspectives. Give your old eyes a vacation. Try on a different head. Unless we discover civility and create new institutions to tame our greed and gentle our anger, every advance in technology will bring us nearer to barbarism and cosmicide. Our best hope for remaining human, and remaining alive, will require us to convert our disposition toward hostility to a disposition toward kindness. We shall need to devote the full energy of our imagination and will to finding a way to live in relative harmony with our neighbors. For the time being, it is good enough if we can manage to avoid unnecessary battles and to place limits on the weapons with which we keep each other hostage to terror. And when we must fight, it must not be as holy warriors but as deeply repentant men and women who are caught in the tragic conflicts of history that we have not yet had the vision, the will or the courage to change. As the comedian Red Skelton once said, I don't hate my enemies. After all, I made them. I wonder how Sam Keane's thinking might apply to the war in Ukraine. We played a role in this when we failed to give Gorbachev the money he requested to westernize Russia. Not to mention the way we turned our nukes against the Soviet Union after World War II. We certainly didn't do ourselves any favors with all our Red October movies, including even the James Bond series, always depicting Russians as the evil enemy. To summarize, threats are real. Dangers are real. Enemies are figments of our individual and collective imaginations. And, if we are honest with ourselves and each other, 99% of wars in general and the war in Ukraine involve some form of enemy projection, which makes them exceedingly difficult to end. Love shift. If we will work together, we can make a difference.